Hello, everybody, and welcome to Be My Guest. And my very special guest today, I'll get straight to it, is the well-known, renowned Nora Casey. Um, Nora is was um, a member of... Dre Hello, Nora. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> Very well. Um, Nora was a dragon on Dragon's Den here in Ireland. And Nora has um, of late done a huge, uh, colossal amount of work for um, women in, and people in domestic violence uh, situations. She's been on Dancing with, uh, well, Dancing with the Stars or Strictly, Strictly Come Dancing here in Ireland. And she has many, many strings to her bow, not least the fact that her gorgeous house behind you won ah. Celebrity House of the Year. <laughs> Isn't it fabulous, Nora? Hello, Nora. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, it's a nice day. Well, it started sunny up here, so fingers crossed. Yeah. You're in what part of Dublin? Ranala. Ranala. It's a lovely Leafy part. Ranala. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I spend a lot of time, though, um, in the Phoenix Park where I grew up, so I had the best of both worlds. Yeah, it must have been fantastic growing up as a, a child in the Phoenix Park, having that scenery behind you and, I suppose, the Auris, the President's House. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I had the best yeah. house. <laughs> you had the best house. I think the funny thing growing up in the park, my grandfather was a ranger and my father, and so we've been there for generations and we live in a lodge, so there's a number of lodges around the park, and it's kind of a little family all on its own yeah. in the park. Um, you don't really understand how special it is until you go out into the world. You know, now now I look back and think, wow, it was like it's idyllic. You know, having a back garden in the middle of the city. You know, I always say about the Phoenix Park, it's a way of leaving the city without leaving the city. And we were, there was a lot of us, there were eight of us, you know, my mother says, don't be doing the Angela's Ashes now, eight of us in a three bed lodge. But, the, you know, we, there was a lot of us and my father's uh, OPW wages was the only thing that kind of kept it. My mother was a, a nurse and went back nursing after yeah. we were reared, kind of. But I just remember idyllic, beautiful summer's days. They would open that door and we would run wild all over the park. And my dad used to ring a bell at dusk, you know, in the people's gardens to get us all to come back home. And yeah. there isn't one part of the park that I don't know everything about, you know, that I haven't played and explored. Uh, my dad's job took him all over the park. So we went on bicycles with him like ducks, you know, all over the park to Farmley, Island Bridge, Castle Knock, Ashtown. Mm -hmm. um, and I just... I, I look at it now, walking through the park, and I think, wow, anybody would give the right arm to grow up in a beautiful place like this. I wonder, was it our childhood? Because I can remember we're the same age, um, Nora, you and I. And um, I wonder, was it our childhood that was so good, <laughs> that we had it so good that we always thought that the sun was shining? Or was it always shining? What I, is it about? Because I can't remember a bad day. No, I can't. I, I think, um, firstly, I would say when, you know, when there's a strong emotion attached to a memory, it's stored slightly higher up in your brain. So sometimes we remember the summer days because they were probably more fun. Um, yeah, we, uh, when I think now, we used to go on holiday to Port Tran, where my father's, um, my uncle lived. And yeah. that felt to me like I was going to the Caribbean. So yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. we would get, <laughs> we didn't have a car early on in my childhood. So we would get buses and trains and end up in Dunabate and get a bus from Dunabate out to Port Tran. And then we'd be at the seaside and the swinging boats and uh, all I remember was us running into that sea constantly all day every day yeah um, and in my head it was beautiful azure gorgeous tropical waters you know <laughs> and now I look at it and I think oh wild horses wouldn't get me in there to swim you know? <laughs> it's the same with me in Wales Porth Cull my father's people were from Wales and I'd go back regularly and I had this idyllic view or image of Porth Cull and again, the Asia blue uh, sea, and it was far from Asia blue when I grew up. <laughs> do you know? But do, do you think that? Uh, do you think that that is why? Because your mother was a nurse, that that's what um, compelled you to go down the uh, initially down the um, nursing route. Uh, maybe there's a long line of nurses in my family. So my aunt, my godmother was a nurse and I have uncles who are nurses in St. Edith's and Port mm. Dran, And so there was a lot of nurses. I, I think, to be perfectly honest, what inspired me more was getting out of uh, Dublin. 
which is an odd thing to say because I was only 17 yeah. at the time but I was one of those children who went to school early uh, because my birthday's in August so I ended up finishing my leaving cert uh, when I was 16 so I had a year to kick around I was actually raising two baby gorillas in Dublin Zoo Yink oh, and Gory. I worked in Dublin Zoo all my life it's a, it was my second home you know and, oh, yeah. um, and I was kicking my heels around thinking you know well I go to college or my father like the civil service of the bank um, and then suddenly the the lovely ranger who run the Park Gate Street Lodge lived in that lodge. His daughter had fallen in love with a Scottish policeman and had gone over there to work in a hospital on the banks of Loch Lomond. And she gave a brochure to my father who gave it to me and I phoned up and they were desperate for nurses. And I ended up in the banks of Loch Lomond in Scotland at 17, training to be a nurse. I didn't at the time imagine it was my job for life, but I did really love it. I think within six months, apart from the homesickness, which was huge because there was nobody in the west of Scotland that was in any way non-Scottish other than me. All the girls went yeah. home at the weekend. I just remember long weekends from Friday to Sunday night on my own in the nurses' home. Yeah. But I loved being a nurse and I ended up staying in it for five years. After I qualified, I did cardiac and then I went over to Edinburgh to do burns and plastic surgery. Um, and I guess that was the point where I probably realized it wasn't something I wanted to do forever. Firstly, because it's, I was always afraid of meeting a burns victim. You know, this, yeah. this hospital that I trained in, in the Vale of Leaven is very small. Uh, you'd end up in running casualties as it was then, um, you know, on long nights and road traffic accidents would come in, everything and anything would come in from the Highlands. So I always thought, I don't mind what comes in as long as it's not a burn. You know, it's not somebody from a, a house fire. Phobia you had. So, so I confronted the fear by doing a year's programme um, with burns um, in, in, um, in Edinburgh. And... Uh, Bangara is it's the home of actually uh, the forceps and everything. Bangara is like the home of plastic surgery, not cosmetic surgery, I hasten to add. So we were dealing with very extreme cases, children from house fires, um, teenagers who'd had multiple operations from, you know, um, from fire scarring. And I really felt at the end of it that I didn't want to spend my life doing it. I was 23 at the time. Um, an opportunity came up to work for the Royal College of Nursing in London as an yeah. officer. And uh, I went for three or four interviews. So that I really still to this day don't know how they employed me because you were supposed to be 25 and um, I was as green as get out as they said themselves. Uh, but they did, uh, I did you have a lot something of- in you. Yeah, I, I, I actually loved nursing so much. I got actually quite political about nursing and about the need for us to move to student status. I was part of the roster on the ward and uh, I was very uh, active within the Royal College of Nursing as a voluntary member. So, and believe you me, by the time I'd invited people from London headquarters up to the back of nowhere in Loch Lomond, they remembered me. <laughs> So when I went for the interview, I... You're not somebody I, that they forget very easily anyway. Nora, well, they also had to take planes, trains and automobiles to get to this place. You know, it was so out of the way. But I, I think I had a lot of knowledge, which a lot of people at 23 might not have had, partly because I had all that extra time at the weekends. I cared passionately about the profession of nursing, still do, still work very closely with them, um, about the need to kind of develop nurses as uh, independent practitioners. I was always very, I still am very um, keen to explore what's uniquely nursing as opposed to medicine. You know, at that yeah. time, people used to say, oh, did you not get enough points to be a doctor? They could never really understand that nursing it's is terrible. It's terrible. Separate. Yeah. Are you, glad, are you glad that it's changed now from the way, the, the, the way it, uh, you trained as a nurse before to oh, yeah. now it being a degree, a, a degree course, a Bachelor of Science a hundred percent. I think there's in the UK they're putting in place a year's um, kind of a practical placement. The one thing that's missing is um, for, uh, the same for all graduates, by the way, even ones that come out with journalism yeah. qualifications, is that they're not. I call it the sheep dip. You know, in the days when it, the the economy was boomier, we could all afford to take in graduates and then spend a year you know, teaching them how to work on the workplace. Yeah. Um, nurses don't come out of college like other graduates, fully formed and ready to practice on the ward. So they definitely need that extra year, I think, uh, doing placements. And in addition to the placements they do in college, which aren't sufficient, you know, no. um, to try and help them to understand the practicality. So it, there's an art and science to nursing. And I guess that the uh, degree level education 
helps people to understand the science and they get a glimpse of the art, but really it's not until they qualify that they, they get to understand it more. That, that's true. I mean, they're thrown into the big bad world without um, any, without any um, uh, practical experience, any great practical experience. Yes. And yeah, but working in the workplace for about a, a year, at least a year or two, would give them that. Uh, yeah. once they're qualified. But what was it um, in you as a person that you decided to take the journalistic route? route. Yeah. I was, so you have to remember, I was, was a completely different area. Yeah, very but, different. But, but still you were a curious person. And there's so. journalism in my family too. I guess yeah. the, the two aspects of my life would be journalism and nursing. I was 23 in London working for the Royal College of Nursing, which had a very twin set and pearls image at the time. And I was yeah. the youngest thing to ever work in the headquarters. I was looking after the student nurses. There were about 60,000 of them at the time. And um, they wanted to change their image. They had a very bright, since deceased general secretary called Trevor Clay. And uh, he yes. said, you know, why don't we use Nora in our media profile? So they took me off and trained me to within an inch of my life. I remember doing two weeks with somebody videoing me and playing it back and critiquing me every evening. I did, um, you know, public speaking. I started so that it, through a whole series of, what do you call it? Like glossing you up. <laughs> for two years my, you know i i have a very natural irish accent anyway it's never yeah. had much um inflection um but i think all of that rigor and i was writing i was doing the news in the evening i was you know regularly appearing on the bbc and itv and i had a great mentor who was a man at the time uh he was another man who was a nurse and he was my boss and he sat me down one day and said here you are now what are you going to do with your life because uh, you're not going back to nursing. By then I was, you know, so used to doing other things and you can't stay in this job forever. You're looking after student nurses. So there's, there's an inevitability that you don't want to do that forever. What, why don't you think of journalism? And so he nudged me in that direction. It, it was a big decision because I had to go right back to the bottom again. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had achieved a certain status. I was driving a car, the company car. I had an office, I had a secretary. I was, you know, earning, I think, about 10,000, which was a fortune at the time. And yeah. uh, suddenly I was right back to like two grand <laughs> graduate. <laughs> I, I did my journalism training in Harlow. There were four centers for the National Council. You where I was born in Wembley. Yeah, yeah. I, I like Harlow. Um, so I did my graduate, I did, they accepted my nursing qualifications as um, a graduate level and I did the postgrad program and, you know, served my time doing news reporting and um, births, deaths and marriages and all of the usual stuff you get to do in the early days, court reporting. Um, Facts on the roads. And then I very cleverly matched the two qualifications. Very few people were qualified in nursing and journalism and I went back to work for a nursing publication first called Nursing Standard and then eventually I started to run a separate business. We, you know, I'd say very few people know this, but my real claim to fame is I published peer-reviewed journals during that period, including evidence-based practice with the British Medical Journal uh, with Richard oh, Smith. Okay. I, I co-edited that. Uh, people always say, that what's your claim been interesting. to fame? Well, you know, uh, we worked with the Cochrane Centre in the University of York and David Sacker, who was at that time the foremost expert in evidence base in Oxford and the University of Toronto. So there are the three top centres in the world that were trying to achieve, you know, the holy grail of doctors having to read 14 miles high of the Lancet and the BMJ and the New England Journal of Medicine not being sustainable if we wanted them to stay current in their practice. So in a way, we did all the hard work so they didn't have to. But the irony is we, we employed about 130 um, reviewers, researchers and reviewers in Toronto. They were the centre for the review. And we started to review and peer critique um, all of the English speaking research in the medical field and medical and associated practice fields. And we were only interested in those gems that tipped practice over the edge in, in terms of a change. So a lot of research, as you know, just builds up into more research and the need for more research and the replication. So every now and again, this gem will come along that will signal a change to insulin, for instance. I just remember that because it was in the first issue. Um, and so we, we did all the thorough background work and then the first issue we were funded partly by the BMA and um, 
other organisations. I think they put millions in and we only had 16 pages after a year and a half. And I remember <laughs> the Department of Health coming along saying, is this a joke? Like we're at the launch party and myself and Richard Smith were making these speeches about how we'd just broken the mould and that the world is never going to be the same again. And he was picking up this flimsy thing saying, is this what our millions had bought? And, and we were trying to explain, but underneath that, there's the solidity of people, you know, in the professions understanding that if they read that one page summary, which tells them about the research and the change. And then there was always an expert consultant review at the bottom. So um, I remember particularly the diabetes one because it was a huge issue for the World Health Organization. And this one piece of research did actually signal a change to insulin therapy. And one of the foremost European, European uh, experts in diabetes wrote the little review at the bottom. But you know, in the space of about five minutes, um, somebody working in that area could read that and would be current and up to date in their practice and know that the back end of that was really scientifically proven and secure rather than it's quite spurious at the moment you know as to whether in in, in the midst of covid we've had nothing but non-peer-reviewed speculative pieces uh, described as research so absolutely I, I, absolutely nora absolutely yeah. And, and I you think that rigor, it, that rigor, sorry, Mary, stayed with me for my life. You know, I, I was doing my own PhD at Wales at the time in the University of Cardiff. And I just, I've always in my life looked to science whenever there's an issue or a problem, no matter what has hit me in my life, I delve into the research, the science, um, and try yeah, to- Yeah, you have a scientific brain. Totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and an and, and, and analytical brain. You, yeah. try, you try to analyze everything. Do you think that that is what uh, stood to you when you, I would have always thought I had a creative brain because I was, my primary degree was art and design in the Limit College of Art and Design. And then I went into literature, which isn't, it, it's all the creative side as well. Yeah. But yet I love science and I love, I loved biology in school and that, and I do, I do love science. Um, but do you think that that analytical brain has carried you into your business? Um, because you've gone on and you've written books and you've, I mean, you, you've, and, and you've uh, founded businesses and you've become a huge uh, philanthropist um prob uh, you you're still recognized as our as our as our greatest philanthropist in this country Thank you. and and i mean you you were with dragon's den for 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 quite a number of years and um and you've also written books now uh, i feel about 90 that, mary <laughs> yeah i know but you packed so much into such a young life <laughs> I think I think I personally am also somebody who's half art, half science, uh, because you have to remember that even during that period of my life where I was disciplined in in that peer critique, you know, I I, I established probably blind peer review systems in the UK. I was studying with Smith and Nephew in the US uh, to bring in um, continuing education across the profession. So I was, there was one part of my life that was very much about that very big discipline and then I was also uh, presenting a program for the BBC in the evening called the Learning Zone. I was working at LBC on my own show on which is a um, sorry it's a radio station in London on yeah, Sunday. I, didn't know, I, um, I did a show with another it was called Viva and it was then bought by um, the man who owns Harrods can't remember his name now, but uh, um, Fayad, 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 uh, yeah, Fayad, yeah, um, yeah. Dodi, uh, Dodi, Dodi Fayad's father. father. <laughs> yeah. So he bought it over, and it was a women-only station, and then he bought it over, and it wasn't anymore. And uh, so I was <laughs> all my, a lot of my spare time was being spent doing very creative things, while I was very disciplined in the day job. I think when I was about. Um, 28, so still very young, I was editorial director of this uh, company, very big company, doing, we had a book publishing division, we had a huge conference division, we had a huge periodical division, and um, I really was getting a kick more out of launching, acquiring, merging, you know, and realized that probably my destination was more as a CEO than it was in the, uh, in the creative side of the business. So. They eventually appointed me CEO before I was 30 and realized I was a terrible one. Um, I wanted to be friends with everybody. I wasn't going to make any decisions um, without consulting 50,000 people. And so I went to Ashridge Management College and I studied strategic management, which really saved me um, 
it's kind of a two year program where you're yeah. locked in for weeks at a time and you have your own mentor. I actually went back then in, you know, a few years later and did advanced strategic management. I'm still a lifelong alumni member of Ashridge. Um, it's definitely my management home and I actually helped them to develop their women in leadership program after that. Yeah. It's in, uh, it's in Berkhamstead. It's, it's, you know, out in one of those leafy, beautiful suburbs in the North uh, West of London. It's gorgeous. So, I think that the one thing I learned during all of that period was education was the most important thing to me. Every single time I wanted to switch career or I wanted to take on something new, I went back and studied. That's a bit like what I am, Moni. I don't, I'll admit I haven't done an eighth of what you've done, Nora. I mean, uh, I feel in inadequate, quite frankly. Um, and I thought I'd done a lot because, you know, I mean, I think I think life is 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 a is a continuous learning process, yeah. and I'm a great uh, believer in lifelong learning and people going too. back and not stopping and and you know people say oh God when are you going to stop studying? Probably yeah. never because I yeah. like I like the challenge. Yeah, and also you have to remember I didn't have a normal um, decade in my twenties, so yeah, they call it in. in in marketing terms, it's called the decade of indulgence. In Ireland, it's 23 to 33. It's slightly later than other places. So the end of full-time study and the start of your wonderful decade of looking after yourself. And then at, at around 33, we usually settle down with a career or, you know, man, woman, partner, mortgage, uh, you know, responsibilities. And during that decade, it really is supposed to be all about you. You're traveling the world, you're spending on yourself. You don't care about any responsibilities. But I was actually married very young in my 20s and yeah. and it wasn't a good marriage and yeah. because of that I compensated hugely by working like a Trojan and I think that's what we do we yeah. do it yeah and I, I do I do in a way for all the negatives of that period in my life I would never have achieved anything um, like what I've achieved if I didn't have that time where I was trying to eat it up with other things I would try to stay out of the house as long as possible I was always yes. locked into my office studying something or I had to go to yeah Wales that's to... exactly it you're dead right yeah. I do look back on that you know outside of the the difficulties of the marriage I look back at that and I think how was I doing an MPhil at the University of Wales <laughs> and I did two years at Ealing College studying TV production I mean how on earth did I do all of that but the reality is I didn't have a good personal life a good yeah. social life yeah um, you yeah, know, so. we all we all compensate. We find things yeah. to, to clutter our lives with, to yeah. to face the reality of yeah. of um of our lives. Um, but uh, tell me a little bit, if you don't mind, Nora, about that time in your in your well, in your life. I think um, for one thing, I was coming out of nursing, and uh, what I know now is that sometimes people who have an empathetic nature are often a target for people who consciously or unconsciously want to control you. And I was very isolated from my family. I had moved from Scotland down to London. So I was all alone. I was living with a, a friend's elderly relative in Hammersmith and he was much older than me. Um, he was in his uh, 40s and he was a very successful business person, um, very wealthy and very sophisticated. I was none of those things, and yeah. when I when I met him first, um, I was kind of surprised how quickly the relationship developed. You know, I'd only really had casual relationships up until then, and I think you know very soon uh, after that, he was kind of offering me gifts, telling me how much he loved me, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that he couldn't live without me, and that I was everything to him, and I was his princess, and you know, it's really. It's weird through the, le through the lens of time yeah through the lens of time and now i've sat with women the same as me and they all say the same and i'm like how was i so dumb that i didn't see that no, you, you don't yeah. in your early 20s i thought all the time somebody who loves me this much couldn't possibly want to harm me and i would love to say to uh the world that i you know, got trapped in a marriage that ended up being abusive, but actually he was abusive before we got married. You know, yeah. I think only um, a couple of years into the relationship, he was always telling me he wanted to take me around the world. Now, at this point I was living with him. He only drove Porsches. I'm giving you a hint of the lifestyle here. He, his day job was a Range Rover and his evening was Porsches. And I was being introduced to, you know, like a little uh, Eliza Doolittle type of um, scenario for me, learning how to, you know, 
use cutlery and be sophisticated and drink wine. I don't think I'd ever drank wine in my life until I met him. And and then he was taking me around the world, uh, which was amazing. And we'd gone out for dinner the night before, all the bags were packed and we were coming up the driveway of the house and I said something that must have annoyed him. I still don't know what it was, but I do remember him slamming the steering wheel and he screeched the car to a stop and he got out his side of the car, slammed the door. And I was like, oh, what did I say? What did I do? <laughs> and he opened my side of the door and I got out thinking he was going to help me out or something. And he just grabbed my head and slammed it off the top of the Porsche, like really slammed it very, very hard. It was one of those jolts where you're not quite sure what has happened. And I'm still standing next to the open door of the car and he casually opened the front door, went in and went up to bed. And I was stunned and went inside and my head was really sore, banging, you know, my, my ear was beginning to swell up and I was sitting in the front room thinking, what the hell, how did that happen? Yeah, That's unbelievable that somebody did that to me. And there was all these confused emotions about, Jesus, you can't possibly stay in this house with somebody who would do that to you. And it's amazing how you do stay with somebody right. like that. Yeah, then the next moment I'm thinking, what did I say that made him do that? And... And before I'm finished, you know, my two or three hours of staring into space, I've already decided what kind of makeup I might put on to hide all the bruising that had come up all down the side of my face. And the next morning we got up silently, didn't speak, went to the Heathrow. And uh, it wasn't until we were up in the air and we were sitting an aisle apart from one another uh, in business. And he reached out and he started to touch the side of my face that was full of bruises and he was crying. And he started to profess his, you know, regret and that it was all about his stress levels and the coming up to leaving for a big round the world trip. And he couldn't believe he'd done that to me and he'd never do it again. And, you know, I, I at the time was feeling, what am I doing sitting on this plane? I'm now trapped with this man who did this to me. But at the same time, anybody who takes me around the world is bound to love me. And, you know, he's not going to harm me. So this was like yeah. music to control my ears. Them. It was a control. Yeah. I think I, I welcomed him saying all of that because I believed it and yeah like I mean I didn't know then that if somebody slaps you once they're never going to stop I I just believed that he was contrite and it was an aberration and it was never going to happen again and you know that should have been my warning call and that's really why I try and fundraise for young people to recognize a toxic relationship because I didn't um, and I spent a long time I was uh, nine years with him and during that time, there were some very violent moments I've spoken about. It. I can't go back there now, Mary, if you don't mind. No, but that's okay. I still have all of the scars and, you know, ribs that have healed. I, In fact, he, he broke bones here on the side of my face. And the irony is every time I'm at my happiest and I smile, it doesn't quite go up. So I kind of feel... Reminder. Yes, when you're smiling, that I remember the fact that he punched me. And that's why I can't smile properly, you know, so I'm quite self-conscious when people say, give us a big grin and I don't want to because this is broken here. So I think that, um, like most people, I tried many times, I think probably about two years out from when I finally left him, I had decided I needed to leave after a very violent incident. And every time I tried to raise it, he threatened to take his own life. He would go into a fit of rage. He'd throw my clothes out the windows, then he'd beg forgiveness, then he'd cry, then he'd say he'd go to some counseling, some psychotherapist, that he didn't mean to do it and that it was me that mm. drove him to it. It was all yeah, confusing. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was a huge part of me that knew that I didn't have any financial standing to leave. I had gone into him. I was, I was in digs, let's say, with this, um, when you met. With my friend's elderly aunt. And I had no savings, nothing. Jeez, you don't come out of nursing with savings, I can assure you. And then go into journalism. Um, so I had none of my own money. He even had my passport. I had no rights to ownership of anything in the house. Um, I did actually in the end, but I didn't know I had. Um, I had nothing and I just knew I'm isolated from my family. I'm in London. If I leave him, what the hell am I going to do? Where that's, am I going that, to live? That, but that's, you know? the, that's what actually, that's the hold that they have over yeah. people. What do you yeah. do? How do you get out of it? What, what's your life going to be without them? Yeah. I'll tell you the, the one thing that, you know, I, I know I went on to a TED talk and everything and I'm still not finished writing about it, but you know, all the people who, and I, I had people saying it to me, what the hell were you doing staying in that relationship? They kind of don't really understand that. You complex. never understand. 
it's a very complex arrangement when you love somebody and it's all bound up in this coercive control and um and i i think um what changed see how uh, the most important thing which i named my ted talk is how did you leave not how did you why did you say you know um i i'm two years trying to leave him i'm telling you on friday nights i would come home from work and uh, I worked up in Harrow. It was a long journey yeah. down to uh, Wimbledon. And all the way down, I would promise myself, this weekend I'm leaving him. This weekend I'm going to tell him. This weekend I'm going to leave him. And I would drive all the way into work on Monday morning crying, saying, why didn't I do it? How could I not have had the strength to do it? Then I went home this weekend without him, which was, you know, a difficulty. I mean, I'd only arrived in the house in Dublin and he'd have sent a bouquet of flowers on ahead. My father thought he was the loveliest man, landed on your feet. He would shower me with gifts. And the more abusive he was, the more gifts I got. So I yeah. went home on my own. It was, I, it was a family event and I was out with my mom. And she said to me, is there something going on? Mother's you know, instinct. Yeah. And I told her everything. And because I told her everything, I knew I had to leave him. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. That's I the, can't describe why that is. I had never no. told anybody. I understand never, perfectly. Not, not even, you know, I, up until that moment, I had told nobody, not even my sisters. And after a very violent incident, um, I had a sister who was around me at the time and I had black eyes, blue eyes, I had swellings, I had ribs broken. And she kept saying, what happened to you? And I said, I fell down the stairs. But then I remembered I told people in work I was in a car accident. Like, and I, all my lies are kind of flying around my head at the time. So here I am, just having told my mom, and her saying you have to leave. There's no going back then. And I went and that that Friday, um, not even waiting until I was driving home, that Friday morning, I woke up at about five o'clock, had a shower, packed a small bag, and I woke him up and I had a speech prepared. I'll never forget it, like the black humor about it now. I had this speech <laughs> prepared as to why I was leaving him. So I wake him up and I'm telling him that I've, you know, put up with, you know, one too many punches and blows and the abuse and everything else and that I need to leave. And I can hear him gently snoring while I'm only five minutes into the speech. Like he was like looking at me saying, what are you going on about? You know, go back to bed. And then he just fell asleep five minutes into my little speech. So. But I remember getting into the car. You got to say it anyway, Nora. And I you drove got to away. articulate the words. Yeah, it was like driving off a cliff. I can't describe it. I drove away from that house with that little bag, not knowing where I was going to live. I actually ended up in an Ibis at Heathrow because it was the cheapest place I could find. And it was near Harrow where I worked. I obviously hadn't told anybody at work. And I phoned my sister, my younger sister. And I talked to her. She couldn't believe it. And I just kept saying, I've left him, I've left him. And she talked me off the ledge, really, for the 20 minutes it took me to go into work because I had to face work. I, you know, yeah. Yeah. It was unheard of in those days to go in and say to somebody, sorry, my husband's abusive. Can I have a day off because I've just left my home? That's probably um, the best thing that, that it gave you. It, it, it actually yeah. gave you the normality. Exactly. And I think then uh, having left him, he, of course, went into very... Uh, a very difficult period of threatening to take his own life and doing all sorts of very dramatic things to try and get me back. And at that point, my biggest fear was I would go back. Like I was sitting on the floor of a, a hotel in Ibis in, in Heathrow, listening to, you know, families and kids going off on the best vacation of their lives. And my whole life was wrecked. I didn't know where I was going to live the next night or the night after that. And everything in me was saying, Jesus, don't crack, don't go back. Because, yeah, you know, yeah. I know there's a wardrobe full of my beautiful clothes in that house and there's a bed and there's an office and my computer's there and in a nanosecond I could get in the car and go back and he'd forgive me and we'd all be so I stayed away I had some really really you know people that were unlikely friends at the time my finance director at work <clears throat> who we ended up being good friends he um his he organized for his brother to let me sleep in uh, a couch in the sitting room um I had a really good nursing friend in Northern Ireland who eventually ended up helping me to get an apartment um which was owned by a surgeon in Northern Ireland still know that family and he was working a couple of days in London every week but he didn't really need it he said he could go over and back in the one day and he let me stay so you do realize that you know People, people are uh, people, the quality yeah, of people and i'm not sure i i didn't really you know obviously my friend who's the nurse in northern ireland was very close to me and after i left um peter i told her and you know there was a, a small group of people who are like supporting me through it all and i did stay away which is great that it's it's amazing how once you know once you actually tell somebody 
that it's that it's that actual one moment that yeah. when you tell somebody um, that you can't go that that's that's the breaking point I think for most people in a situation I suppose speaking. And Mary, it's like um, yeah. It's like it's the first time you've admitted it to yourself. Yourself, yeah. You know, I was killed saying to myself, sure, you know. Uh, but we're you feel it's France. a betrayal of them as well. You feel it's a betrayal of them to tell yeah. anyone. So when you finally do tell somebody, you feel, well, I finally betrayed them. I can't, yeah. you know, the, it, 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 there's, no, there's going no going back. back now. Yeah, it's definitely... You know, I, I definitely think there's something in that. There's not a huge amount of research in, in how people li leave abusive relationships. Um, it's something I'd love to do more about. Uh, yeah. Talking to women, I can see so many similarities mm -hmm. between us. Um, and if we could find that, you know, in a way, I think the difficulty at the moment is we do, I, me included, spend all our time raising the profile encouraging women to come forward, getting them to phone, the bystander campaign. Um, and, and your global ambassador for Vital Voices, is that? Is yes, that that's much? not in, no, that's more in, um, so Vital Voices I've been working with for a few years and I'm on the European board and as you say, I'm an ambassador, a global ambassador. Um, by Hillary Clinton. And Madeleine Albright. Madeline Albright. And, and it was set up initially to support women after the Beijing Conference for Women. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's a hugely successful organization globally and its purpose in life is to support women in um, particularly in developing countries but increasingly in developed countries too and it doesn't support organizations it'll find that one woman in society that can make a change and they will do everything to train her support her educate her financially help her and their hope is you know it could be a woman who's standing for election every year which there is actually in one of the countries um a woman in her own community who's setting up some fantastic charge but so it's a woman we support rather than an organization my Thank own you. role is on economic empowerment for women. So I think over time they realized that although it's really important to get women into public life and into the voluntary sector and um, and to support them in their charitable works, it's equally important that women should be economically empowered um, in, in all kinds of environments, it, it, as much in Ireland as it is in Africa and in India. So I took on some women around the world. At the moment I mentor a fabulous woman in Delhi who runs on hotel? If anyone ever mm. goes to India, go and stay with. Uh, and you were, you were nominated as woman of the century there, or woman of the decade yeah. there. And that was through another group. I do a lot of webinars in India. Um, believe it or not, there's a phenomenal <laughs> number of women involved in business in India. Um, and some of that's family orientated. So the Women's Economic Forum were having their big event in Delhi and they asked me to go over and pick up the woman of the decade. I don't think I've ever had a woman of the decade. Or, my brother said, what were you decade. doing for the other decade? But I mean, Nora, really. <laughs> Nora, look how life has changed. And, you know, out of adversity, if you like, you were brought up, you were you were spoiled, really, when you were brought up. I mean, you had two parents who loved you and, 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 and you had a great... Uh, idyllic, some would say, childhood. We all had, even though, I mean, I... I only my mum was here with me when my dad couldn't get a job here in Ireland because he wasn't in, he was wasn't Irish, and there was only mum and I. But I thought we were loaded because dad would come like a Greek bearing gifts once a year um, with everything from my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my mother would have would knit everything I ever wore and I thought we were loaded. We didn't even have a car, but we had love. Yeah. And you were the same, Nora. And then suddenly you you're you're thrust into a relationship that you just can't see a yeah. way out of. And then yeah. suddenly you become the you become Nora Casey. I think um, driving away from that house that day, I promised myself I would stand on my own two feet for the rest of my life. That I would never rely on anybody else financially or otherwise. And it gave me, you know, I think taking that step, which was a huge risk for me, it actually gave me, the uh, confidence came later, but it definitely gave me that steel inside myself that I wanted to do something different. I was not a hugely confident child. I wouldn't have been the first one with my hand up in the class. I think anybody who's super confident doesn't end up in nursing. That's the truth. I mean, I love nurses and I love nursing, but it's not, you don't go into nursing to be ambitious and to rise high and to be a great leader. Uh, you go into nursing because you love helping people, you know. <clears throat> I think 
leaving that relationship left me with a, a core of metal inside me that um, made me who I am now. And I, somebody recently asked me to talk about the day that changed my life. Yeah. And they, they thought it was Richard's death or, you know, maybe my marriage or the birth of Dara. But actually it was that day because I would never have met Richard. I would never have had Dara. I would never have launched my own businesses. Um, I wouldn't be anything without having taken that first step to leave that relationship. So out of something which was a great deal of adversity, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, mate, and a, and a huge, uh, I think a huge personal journey in terms of learning, we all learn from failure and it's as much to do with the failure in your personal life as it is not, it wasn't my failure, but you know, it's the same kind of thing that you learn all of these things that you don't really understand at the time. But when I left, I just know that nothing was going to stop me. Yeah. I felt yeah. that I could do anything. After I'd been through all of that, I just felt I need to do whatever I want to do in this life and do it myself, you know, and not- You're making up for the nine years. Yeah. The nine years of control, you've taken yeah. back your control, and I was very you know, driven. It's, it's a, it's a, yeah. And I think uh, the older I got, the more driven I've got. Um, I, yeah. you know, and I, I think you know, for much the same reasons, you know, you go through the same. We've been through more or less the same uh, situation. But uh, what was I going to say to you, Nora? Harmonia and a uh, spark. I've noticed your lovely book in the back here. Do you see the backdrops here? I, I do. Think. I love that. Spark <laughs> and Harmonia. <clears throat> yeah. The around Spark and Harmonia. Tell me about, about those. The book came about, Look, so when, I, when Richard died, I wouldn't have said I was... That's the second husband, Richard. Yes. I and think of him as my only husband. Only he's the husbands. only one I married in a church. And uh, I he was really lovely. Felt I, I airbrushed the other one out of my mind completely, but Richard was the love of my life. Yeah, amazing man. Lovely. I think you get the really terrible one, and then I just, I would never have dated. I would never have put myself out there to meet a man again, ever, not as long as I lived. But Richard was working for the BBC at the time, and we were doing a lot of joint work together. In fact, very few people remember this, but there was a nurse in the UK called Beverly Allett. She was convicted of murder. Oh, that's right, yes. Yeah, yes, yes, And it was yes, by yes. Munchausen's by proxy. Proxy, yeah. And I was in one studio discussing that because of my journalism and nursing qualifications, and she was a nurse. She was in Manchester, I think. And Richard was uh, the health correspondent and was in the other studio, so I didn't meet him, but we were talking on this programme, and that evening there was a media dinner, and I found myself sitting next to him. And he said, who are you? I said, I'm Nora Casey. He said, oh my God, we were just talking on, you know, the one o'clock news together. I said, yeah, yeah. So we met and we were actually doing some joint work with the BBC, not in a relationship, but, but we were good friends, I'd say, just for that year before I left, um, I left uh, Peter. And uh, we eventually reconnected months after I'd left Peter and, you know, started having coffee and, you know, inevitably we... You know, we hit it off. I think because we knew each other quite well, the relationship kind of developed quite quickly into, you know, I just knew. I don't know. You knew was. instinctively. I knew. I mean, he, he was the one that gave me butterflies. I mean, I was in a constant state of fluttering when I was waiting to meet him or and I see his face or he'd come in the door. And I just, it was a totally different experience to, you know, I haven't had a huge amount, sorry, of um, relationships in my life, to be honest with you. So I just kind of... Peter was my first and Richard was my second. So um, I, I didn't have a lot of experience, but I knew this was very different. I was, I was really smitten. And he was too. You know, we were pretty much inseparable very quickly, you know. And you were married for, how long were you married? Oh, God. Oh, uh, I'd say, <clears throat> so Dara was born the year after. Yeah. We got married on New Year's Eve. And then we had one New Year with no baby. <laughs> <laughs> and the following new year, a baby. <laughs> so that was two years. And then he died when Dara was just turning 13. So, yeah, 15. 15 that was so Dara, sad. So, yeah. He died of cancer, didn't he? Yeah, very, very progressive um, and aggressive um, and not diagnosed till quite late. So he was 49 and he was very, um, I would describe Richard as quite fit and healthy. We yeah. just a six month trip to Australia, New Zealand. Um, all over Asia um, and he had had a couple of episodes of don't really think it's it's uh, distasteful but blood in his urine and we thought it was a kidney stone so he'd been checked out a few times in various hospitals in Sydney and places and when he came back he was checked out in 
a couple of hospitals here, all clear, no problem. But then a year later on the eve of his birthday, they diagnosed a tumor in the wet lining of his kidney. So like a bladder tumor, but in his kidney. And they thought that's all there was and they would whip out the kidney and do a bit of chemo. But um, we moved Richard's care to an amazing man in James's hospital. I've always felt you need to be in public hospitals if you've got cancer, their cancer regional centers are really important. And they did a uh, PET scan and they discovered that at that point, we'd just been diagnosed a week or two, he had um, cancer in his spine and um, three in his liver. And they uh, decided that to start with, before they started chemo, that they would do some radiotherapy um, on his spine. And we went to Luke's, which isn't too far from me here. Yeah, I know. But while they were doing the radiotherapy, the tumor in his spine um, shifted and it cracked his spinal cord, the spinal column. And then he was on an emergency list for the Matter Hospital to spinal surgery. But I think... The difficulty was that um, his cancer was too progressed then to open him up. So he was in a wheelchair. I, within four or five weeks of diagnosis, Richard was in a wheelchair and quite sick. And they were no longer talking about um, treatment. They were more talking about, you know, what they would do to try and give him a little bit longer in life. Yeah. Um, it wasn't palliative. No, they, they were all out for this very aggressive um toxic kind of chemotherapy combination that they were going to do on him and James's. But after long months of, you know, most weeks he was, uh, most days he was too unwell to get the chemotherapy and he didn't want to stay in hospital. So we would start very early, five, six every morning, go over to James's and we'd have long days sitting on chairs. And um, it wasn't the most glamorous now. Most of the time I was sitting on a stool and he was sitting on a hard chair and we'd wait for blood results. We'd go for coffee, we'd come back, we'd hear when yeah. we could have chemo. Sometimes we didn't come home till 10, 11 o'clock at night because they were waiting for his bloods to get better for him. It's terrific, him. isn't it, watching somebody you love die, um, trying to fight, fight. I watched my mum the same way just after my dad died. She was diagnosed. It was there for three years, but she didn't, it wasn't diagnosed. It, it was, but they forgot to make an appointment um, with her until it was too late. Um, so you, yeah, you watch the person you love just I know uh, die in front of you. <laughs> I know. Gradually. It's indescribable. I'll, I would say, of all the things that I was worried about, Richard's death was really beautiful. He did end up in Blackrock um, in the hospice, and he really only went in there to get his. He had a lot of bone cancer at the time in his ribs, and uh, they discovered cancer in his lungs, and they couldn't get his pain under control and um, James has said look we're not experts really in palliative care so go and see this guy um, Paul Gregan is his name and Blackrock he's, he's chair of the palliative society he's brilliant so we only went out there really to get his pain under control he had a lot of difficult symptoms and they said come in for a few days sure we'll look at all your drugs and we'll change all your drugs but he never came out he got pneumonia he was dead within the two weeks of going in there but it was a very beautiful place for him to be i can't describe how beautiful you know you've been very unlucky in relate you've been as as successful as you've been in I business know. and in your career and everything you've had quite tra tra tragedies in your private life but yet you've had you know a beautiful marriage that you I'm can grateful. that you can i i would only say that um of course, when somebody you love very, very much dies, you go through a very difficult time, and I did. But through time and, you know, looking back, I'm so grateful I had that because I now recognize that not everybody gets to find the love of their life, you know? Not everybody gets to be with somebody who they truly feel is, you know, their soulmate. And, you know, a lot of people are skeptical about that. And, you know, I'm not I'm not sort of saying it's for everybody, but for me, I felt, you know, we never had an argument in our lives ever. We were just always so united. Wonderful. Yeah. And I'm still devoted to each other. You know, I, I loved his company more than anyone else's. You're on the same page. Yeah. yeah. But Nora, tell me about your book, Spark. Spark was so... I think you know by now that my default position when things are difficult is to work. So <laughs> I left uh, 
the company wasn't really where I needed to be at the time. I think if you're running a busy media company, you need to be all in. I didn't really want to be the life and soul of the boardroom. I didn't want to be initiating great ideas. I, in fact, didn't want anybody near me. It was enough to get up every day and try and get Dara to school. Um, and in, in fact, a lot of the people at work were very grief stricken because they loved Richard. And, you know, I found myself going in there and picking up the computer and there would be threads there of emails Richard had sent me and it was constant presence as, you know, his office was near me. And I just said, it's not for me. I, I'll, I'm going to leave it for a while. My brother ended up running that for me for a while. I'm back running it again, but he did. He was great. And I went off to Wicklow to walk in the forest. Um, I think there was always a view that you should spend a little bit of time with yourself. I can tell you for no nothing that I was not good company for myself. <laughs> and but it you wasn't went the back right to thing. your childhood. You went back to the woods. Yeah. And Darren and I amazing? kind of uh, in, in that new word cocooning, we were definitely cocooning down in the forest and walking through the streams and talking about it, it just rained. I remember it raining incessantly all day, every day, and all the different conversations about rain because nobody could really talk to you about the fact that you just had a tragedy. So there'd be like the rain and the quality of the rain and the type of rain. And so out of the blue then, I had been doing a lot of you know, maybe not since my 20s, I had been presenting in my 20s, but obviously when I came back to Ireland, nobody knew that. And they'd use me as an expert commentary on lots of different programs. And then Vincent Brown went on holiday and TV3 called me and said, Vincent Brown's going on holiday. We're trying out some unusual people to host the show. Would you do a couple of nights for us? And I said, yes. Now, not even thinking because at the time, I could hardly string a whole sentence together. Yeah. I did not want to talk to anyone. I couldn't even have a conversation with my mom, you know, who's closest to me than almost anybody. And I'm down in Wicklow, you know, looking at the sky all the time. And I've just agreed to go on national TV. So I know it was TV3 at the time, but I, I drove up there and, you know, looked at the building. It was that like moment of, you know, parking the car and saying, oh my God, what are you doing here? And we were hours before the show. It was on the fiscal treaty. I know Pat Rabbit was on. There was a lots of heavy hitters and it was a very, very, you know, I love all that stuff, by the way. So, you know, and there I was in the boardroom and lovely producer who I know since said, uh, here's all your research pile, you know, high of research to read for that evening. And can I get you a cup of tea? And, you know, she was really polite and nice and I said no I'm great I'm great and then I got up and threw up threw up in the bathroom and with stress <laughs> that's like it. something I do that's like something I was doing nearly before uh, before this interview I, mean, I was, a, <laughs> I was well, just so nervous. Nervous. Your sister. and I was then um sitting trying to plow through this huge mile of stuff I was supposed to be reading and every sentence would slither out of my brain as soon as I read it so I was kept reading the same paragraph over and over and she would come in and say how are you doing and I would just lift a big bunch off the top and put it down and say great I finished that but I didn't finish it at all I was and Nora I was, wanted to take on yourself but I I you know I did throw up a lot that afternoon so now we're in the <laughs> studio and I have the thing in my ear the earpiece in my ear and the you know the auto cue and the uh, the floor manager counting down and I had the biggest stress rash, you know, which sort of started here, went all down, bright <laughs> red stress rash, no saliva, all the usual. And I'm looking at this panel thinking, how am I going to even ask them a question? I can't remember a thing in my head. I don't know what happened. By the time the music started and the opening credits, the I... The performer took over. Started reading the auto cue, got into it. I don't even remember. It was like a blur. And then the floor manager saying five minutes to wrap, four minutes, three minutes, two minutes, you know, and we were finished. And I was energized beyond energized. I was like yeah, yeah, yeah. leaping out of the chair with all of this adrenaline and energy and everything. And I was on the way home to my mother and I couldn't stop talking. And did you see this? And you see that? And, and she's gone, oh my God, she said, you haven't said a sentence in months. And look, listen to you. And I realized then that if your personal life is in, is in a wreck, as it was, that you could get some really great energy out of doing something different. You know, it, it, I've never felt pushing yourself beyond. Yeah. Think, yeah. I, I was absolutely terrified. And there's a thing about being absolutely terrified that's really good for your brain. It kind of releases all this dopamine and everything. So the thing that you can't get by lying on the sofa, you know, watching Netflix, uh, I was just getting in droves by sitting in this studio and. I just got an addiction to it. Who would have thought that Vincent Brown would have been the reason? Exactly. I was like, I went back to the next 
<laughs> I went back the next night and I flew through it. Then news talk were looking for a replacement of Ivan Yates for a year. He was going off to <laughs> Wales. So I tried out for that and then I got that job and that was breakfast with Chris Donahue. So we were up at 4.30 every morning, broadcast from 7 till 10. And in the middle of all of this, RT said, would you like to be tried out for this afternoon show we're doing, which is the Today Show that Maura and I do? And I said, well, look, I can't do five days a week because I'm getting up at 4.30 in the morning. By the way, I was still did one season of Dragon's Den and I'd committed to doing 13 episodes of something called The Takeover, which yeah. was uh, a great series on RT, mm -hmm. uh, RT2. So they said, well, why don't you think about doing just Friday? So we're going to do a kind of a, you know, loose women thing on Friday and Blonadney Coffee did it with me and she went down on Thursday honestly did the legwork by the way and I stumbled out of news talk at 10 30 and I had a taxi driver who was out of work who drove my car for me because it was cheaper anyway for RTE to pay for him to drive me down and I slept there was duvet and cushions in the back cover so oh, fabulous all the way to Cork and then I'd wake up and this wonderful makeup artist Georgina used to say to me do you want more lashes Nora I'd say I'd love more lashes I spent all week talking about politics and you know the economy and give me more lashes now so I can go on this show but it was you know I hadn't a moment to myself it suited me a lot because I was up hugely early in the morning but I was there for Dara every evening um you know we spent in the evening time we did a um we did a news conference, it's about 6, 6.15, and I had my homework for the night. In other words, who I was interviewing the next day. So Dara and I did our homework together. We were both in bed at 9.30. I was up and out the door at a great housekeeper who came in and his lunch, I left all his lunch and everything in his uniform. She used to sort him out and he'd cycle to school. And I was there as soon as he came in in the evening or pick him up. So it worked very well for us uh, for a year and a half. I honestly, I think Oliver Callan had once said there's loads of jobs in Ireland. It's just that Nora Casey has them all. You know, I was absolutely... You were being greedy. You were making... Run it. ragged and doing all this stuff. But I needed to work all that out of myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so I'm coming out of news talk at the time and I agreed to do a Sunday show, which is called Mind Feet, which I love doing. And I eased off on everything. I just did one season of the Today programme. I realised that was probably uh, too difficult for me to do. I'd left Dragon's Den and I probably was still doing the takeover and I said you know what I'm going to do I'm going to write I, I write when I feel distressed and to get rid of my um you know if I feel very strong emotions like I did after Richard died I tend to write it's my default position so yeah. yeah I'd already feel screen you do a lot of travel, travel writing yeah, but I'd filled screens and screens and screens of writing about the experience of Richard dying and um uh, just how did I get out of that? You know, it, it was kind of this feeling that, oh my goodness, here I am coming out the other side, beginning to feel, you know, of course my personal life is a wreck, but I have all of this amazing new chapter in my life, which I never asked for and I wouldn't have wanted, but I do have it and it saved me, you know, in a way it wasn't really about the the stages of grief that saved me. Yeah. It always really bothered me that people were asking me, was I in denial or was I in anger or was I in this or that? And um, in fact, what saved me was this abject terror and fear that I faced in TV3 that carried me over the line into this new zone in my life, which I never would have discovered. So for all the wrong reasons, and I had a, a very strong moral imprimatur inside me that said for all the Richards who die too young, who you know don't get to live their lives. this you were all. living you, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah all the people in hospices that won't get to people with ability yeah, think, issues yeah i can understand um, that you know their mothers who unlike me you know i of course worry about dara's exams in ucd and they're worried about getting clean food and water for their children every day in sierra leone so i, I recognize the fact that if i was going to really live the next bit of my life i had to do things totally differently and that Firstly, let me explain to those people who are in the same position as me almost. How did I get out of it? What, what might help you to get out of it? Um, and the book was really that. It was, it was really trying to use science to describe, you know, of course my heart was broken, but not my literal heart, because that just pumps blood around my body. It was my brain that was broken, as in there was no sparks flying off in there anymore. I felt like, you know, I never wanted to get off the couch. So how do you convince somebody who's going through that level of grief with yeah. disinterest in the whole of the world and life to get interested again. And I think I found a way and that inspired me to write the book and to do the Ted talk on the grief thing. Um, yeah. And I shared my story inadvertently 
uh, with Marion Fanuka, never planned it. I was only eight or nine months after Richard died. Um, she was interviewing me on her show and it was a profile piece. I just, you know, a girl growing up in the Phoenix Park ends up in Dragon's Den kind of thing. And she had, she knew Richard from the BBC. And so I, we were in the middle of the interview and she said, and of course, your husband passed away recently. And we got into this without me being prepared already. And before I know it, I'm like physically by his bedside holding his hand while he's dying in my head. In your head, yeah. capable of talking without my voice breaking. And I felt um, ashamed of myself. I We got to the ad break and I said, I'm going to have to go. Um, I was visibly upset at that point. And she was too, by the way. And I ran out of that studio, got into the car. I was talking to my mother on the phone saying, I've just made a show of myself. I cried on national radio. I mean, I just absolutely made a show of myself. And the producer was knocking on the window and he said, look, I'm so sorry. I'm very sorry and I hope you're okay. And I said, I'm okay. And he said, for what it's worth, there are hundreds of people calling in saying they recognize, you know, themselves and you and what you said. Yeah. There was a small growing comfort in that that if you show your vulnerability like i mean what's grief everyone gets but i think it. people want i think we're in, living in a society today anyway that likes and praises um people showing their vulnerability um because to make, yeah you know it's there's very too many important. people there's too many people trying to have the stiff upper lip and trying to try thinking that they're going to embarrass people by getting upset and you know um it's, it's, you know, it's an admirable trait when somebody can actually come on like you and just tell their story because there's thousands in the same boat who aren't, who probably aren't as articulate as you to actually say it, you know? Thank you. But, uh, but Nora, tell us a little bit about Dragon's Den. Uh, I love Dragon's Den and I, more importantly, I loved all the guys that I was the, the rare female dragon and um, I got some really good investments and some really terrible investments. <laughs> so some of them I would have had more fun putting my money down the toilet, but I do have that's a great you, one. That's you on yeah, Dragon's Day. Oh my God, I hardly recognize myself sometimes when I look back. I still look a bit like that, I guess. Um, still, you haven't changed a bit. The hair is the hair is 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 longer now. Lockdown hair. Yeah, and we all mine is tied back. <laughs> um, I think the best investment definitely was uh, under stairs storage. He's an amazing guy, still you know working away there, Paul Jacob, and you know he designed this under stairs storage space thing, and um, as in, in lockdown has developed the sixty second chair, which you can pop a sixty second desk, which you can pop up and use and back onto the um, the bed or whatever. Um, he's just very inventive, and he's making more now in a week than he was doing in a year. You know when I invest in him, and he stayed true to his business. He's he's a great guy. Um, I loved it. I mean, people, I think at home were like. Uh, What's she doing on TV? Well, I, I lived my whole life on TV up to that point. It's just yes. no one in Ireland knew that. It's just funny. You can be on the BBC all day, every day, or ITV, and people don't really see you as somebody who's on TV. So it was less about being on TV, but more about I was keen to invest. I would have probably stayed in the safe zone of media and magazines and that sort of area had I been left to my own devices. I'm sitting in Dragon's Den listening to all kinds of different businesses, yeah. getting interested and excited. And that was what was lovely for me. By the time I came out of Dragon's Den and started doing the takeover, I was building up a, a hugely vibrant business clinic, meeting loads of businesses. And I think I know I'm, I'm writing a book on startup success at the moment. And I, I tried to work backwards to see how many businesses have I actually connected with, strategized with, given advice to. It must be over a thousand. Yeah. Because I had a very busy business clinic and we used to, I used to take appointments from half eight in the morning till half six at night. They got 30 minutes each and if it was worth it, they came back for an hour or. There's not enough hours in the day for Nora Casey. <laughs> there truly isn't. But did you ever, did you ever think that um, there were ever mistakes made on a Dragon's Den? Because I'm thinking I was looking accidentally, I saw a guy on LinkedIn in England who was talking about when he and a friend of his decided to pitch their business in the UK for um, 
they were looking for a hundred thousand for twenty percent investment in their company and their company was a beer company and they got as far as the um the judges and the producers said no it's not going to work and they never got uh, they never got to actually pitching and he said that hundred thousand now would have been worth six hundred thousand um there's, there's very few of them though um, six hundred thousand um, pounds for the twenty percent. Very few of them now that hundred thousand uh, or six, six, so, yeah, something like that would reach those meteoric levels. You have to remember that Dragon's Den is an entertainment show. Yeah. There's a business element to it. It's it survives because people sitting in the armchair saying, "Oh, I could do that," or you know, "That's so stupid. Don't invest in that." They they're the armchair kind of <laughs> entrepreneur in all of us. Um, and and it is very entertaining for something that's No, I just loved watching it. I'm not a yeah, business. Yeah, it's brilliant. But yeah, there's, yeah. there's an element of some of them come in because they're flamboyant or because they're crazy. Yeah, you know, it would be boring if everybody was a solid business coming through the door. And then um, And then you people, buy into people sometimes. A lot of people, not just some people. A lot of people just push to go into Dragon's Den because they want the publicity. They don't want the investment at all. They just want that moment on the TV and you only get the moment on TV if you get investment. If nobody invests in you, you're a fleeting image. You're just shown going in and out or, you know, 10 seconds. So if you get investment and better still, if the dragons are all fighting over you, you get all the publicity you want and the really wise ones then after it say, thanks very much. I don't want your investment. I've got all the publicity I need. And uh, go I, on their merry way. Yeah. I mean, I think the reality for most people, especially in a market as small as Ireland is, you know, you, you very rarely get, the understair storage. I mean, we fought tooth and nail. Uh, myself and Bobby and Sean O'Sullivan fought like dogs over, you know, uh, the understair storage one because here was a man who was already doing a significant amount in turnover, and uh, he was, uh, you could, say he's an engineer. He married to another engineer. Like an amazing backstory. I just knew he was the best thing that ever walked in. And Gavin Duffy whispered to me because he'd already invested a truckload of stuff in that series. It was the very last guy who came in on the very last day. And he said, we never get people like this, grab him, you know. So I did, I got him. Yeah, but you, you don't always get that, you know. And tell me, Nora, um, uh, about your um, house, winning house, uh, as, uh, That's celebrity unlikely. house of the year. <laughs> celebrity house of the year. My house is beautiful, but I wouldn't say it's huge or glamorous. It doesn't I... have to be huge. There we go. There's a photograph <laughs> of your, Nora's oh, yeah. house. <laughs> yeah, my and the three ladies are still there. That that uh, Coco Chanel is part, by the same artist actually, um, up there. And there's some dogs you can see. This is Colin Farrell's brother's husband, uh, who who did these dogs here. They're amazing. They're fabulous. Going, a little bulldog, is it? A little French. There's three bull. of them. I don't know if you can see them. And the, I bought them as a collection to go for Dara's room. So they're going up now shortly. We just had the painters in yesterday. So I'll tell you the the. Firstly, I'm not really somebody who shares a lot about what goes on in my private life. So it was quite a big thing, but it was raising funds for, um, for a charity and mine went to Focus Ireland. So I, I liked the idea of my home raising funds for homelessness. And um, I also kind of had a sense of a bit of an emotional journey with the house because we moved in here just um, before Richard got sick. And all of my memories were of him being sick. You know, I couldn't look at the patio without remembering him and I coming in exhausted from James's and sitting out there having a cup of tea. I couldn't lie in my bed without remembering him struggling to breathe next to me. Everything that's supposed to be a sanctuary about your house was not a sanctuary for me. But at the same time, Dara was very wedded to the house and couldn't let go of it. I mean, his horror would be that if we ever move out of the house. Um, yeah. In practical terms, there's only really two bedrooms there's Dara's bedroom and mine and uh, there's the office here and a big open plan area and some courtyards so I just took a decision on his uh, it was around about his second anniversary I had come across a wonderful woman called Sasha Sykes in the National Gallery and she makes like hedgerows inside perspex so she makes these beautiful pieces where she brings the outside into the house and I said if I'm going to make this house feel good I need to bring in some art I love art so yeah every, I, I, I wish you could see the rest of it my house is festooned in art I have a basement full of it but I said I'm gonna I want to look at beautiful things I don't have to have a big house but I want everything to be beautiful so I called her and I said listen you've never met me you don't even know who I am um, I just saw your work and I thought it was amazing and I wondered if you could 
do some pieces for me. And it was a long journey. She was pregnant in the middle of that. I think it took almost two years. And she made me the beautiful white rose table, which was emblematic of the white oh, roses. Just of my uh, bridal bouquet and then she made this beautiful i don't know if you can see it but this this beautiful piece behind took two years it's resin and it has real rose petals going up the side of it it's a, it's a table behind and this peony i love bird of paradise so she she used that for a chinese lacquer cabinet with peonies, peonies are beautiful and, aren't they? yeah so lavender big lavender cubes instead of bedside lockers and so she was bringing all this amazing art together and i thought okay the house it needs more than that and everything in the house had changed to white in the bedroom that the bedroom was quite oak and i just oh i want everything white, <laughs> white. so that was That's a huge a difference look. Um, a woman who whose husband passed away a few months before me had taken to having coffee with me a lovely woman we met in james's and uh, she said you know what you need to do is change the bed and to me that was like Oh my God, it almost felt the most disloyal thing on the planet. Yeah. I can't remember the time I was plugging in Richard's mobile every evening on the, his bedside locker and his books were still piled on that locker on that side of the bed. And his stuff is, I still have, you know, obviously a lot of stuff belonging to Richard in the basement, beautiful shirts that he loved. I'm going to make into a patchwork quilt. But it was quite a big decision. So I said, okay, I knew more about beds then for about four weeks because I didn't realize it was very complicated to buy a bed. But I bought a new bed and that did make a huge difference. She was absolutely right. It changed the whole mood of going yeah. to bed at night rather than being terrified. I felt it better about way. it. Yeah. And then I, um, Aoife Mullane, who that beautiful cushions and my lovely armchair has done, I, I kind of knew her um firstly amy huberman had been a fan of hers and uh, and she'd some of her work in a, in a spa called oslo and i just thought why do i have art on the walls and now i've got art in these beautiful tables i need to have textile art yeah. well, she's definitely the orla kylie of our generation of her generation she's really artistic the, yeah. that what you can't see is that beautiful velvet with bronze and gold shot through it it's just stunning so i said to her if i'd never met her before i just called her said if would you do something for me she came in we chatted and she made that chair into a beautiful i saw it in Brown Thomas then and the designer pop up and I was like, oh my God, this is like my chair is famous, but um, I just love <laughs> it that, you know, the colors of turquoise and everything. Yeah. So I had- See, when, was, you have the, when you have the white walls, Nora, you can use them as a gallery. You can, you, yeah. you have that almost gallery look because your pictures are adding the color. Yeah, and I, I think there wasn't one part of my house that didn't have lavish love and attention as in, I went around every corner of the house and said, what can I do to make this look better? What art can I bring in to make this look beautiful? I'm quite a minimalist person. I'm also yes. a total Monica. My house has to be beautiful all day, every day. I just can't stand not walking into my bathroom and feeling like I'm walking into the best hotel on the planet. So <laughs> although it's not big, mind, so. <laughs> it was very beautiful. Architecturally, it had been done beautifully anyway. And, um, and I think when the judges came to visit me, of course, I was thinking like, there's no way that I'm not even going to get in the running, you know, because um, some of my fellow dragons live in huge mansions and, you know, I, I don't live like that. I live very simply. But I think that they loved the emotional Simplicity. journey that I had, you know, um, that I was kind of, you know, on this wonderful kind of journey of going from, a difficult relationship with the house to absolutely fallen in love with it again, which I have, of course. But as well as that, you were making a small space. You were filling the small space with love. Yeah. You were actually yeah, exactly. Filling, yeah. You know, it was, um, and it was very space. much a journey of love. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, anyone who, like, I, I, mine is a small house. It's not a big house, but it does. I think it does works for me because there's so much art, you know. And what do you want you know you, you you just want a room to sleep in and a, a place to work in and a, a, exactly and space you can call home yeah place you can call home is the most important thing and it's very much our home now so yeah definitely and i suppose um nora casey the dancer oh the dancer yeah i loved that now it was really nice and it was like something I'd never imagined I'd do in my life. And I really loved it. Um, I got Curtis Pritchard who went on to do Love Island. So he was a great partner. 
um, for dancing. And I, oh, it was just like a, a magical few, oh. you know, that's lovely, Mary. I, I, it takes me back. It was a magical interlude in my life, which was just right at the time. I just sold a chunk of my business to an American company. I had this lovely moment when I felt I could take some time out to do some dancing. And uh, sorry, Mary, I'm, I'm, I know. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know if you can edit that out. <laughs> They're all the natural, the natural moments of life on lockdown. Yeah, I think that's uh, Dara. That's Dara. Yeah, he kind of he's used to me being on, you know, my headphones and earsets, but it's usually just a Zoom call. So, uh, uh, what was I going to say? You you were a natural waltzer. You were natural um, uh, 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 waltzer. I thought. Do you know it? yeah i loved waltzing i did love the um i did love the faster dances too i just had yeah. my name done um Paso was i i liked your passer too yeah it was very much a, an empowered woman dance let's put it that way yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's um, attitude. <laughs> and of course uh we're, we're in practice now for comic relief um and uh, it's been nice to actually learn the steps um again really good yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's uh, what's new for Nora? Uh, what, what what's new on your horizon? What well, I, have what a, do you, I, I know you you you've got many doctorates, um, yeah, uh, no, and, just, and you and you got a fellowship from the Royal College of Surgeons. Yeah, yeah. So I think that um, I uh, I think um, well, what's new is I'm going to um, I'm just about to. Um, finish a chapter on my book. I've got a big <laughs> deadline looming today. So uh, straight away now, I think I'm coming up to my uh, writing time, just coming up now. I'm going to start writing again. I have three books on the go, so I have to get them finished. Um, it's been good in the lockdown, focusing on Woman's Way. It's my last remaining magazine. And um, for some reason, just absolutely shot through the roof and cover sales. We had Nevin Maguire on one, Dermot Bannon, Francis Brennan. I think Nathan Cart is on next week. Uh, Mary O'Rourke is on this week. Just the right kind of champions of women in Ireland to go on the cover. And because Woman's Way is about knitting and crafts and, you know, mindfulness and all of those things, it just so happened that that was perfect. You know, a lot of magazines stopped publishing. A lot of newspapers really struggled. Um, I think that we're probably going to be the last man standing or woman standing in terms of magazine sales. Our, our sales are up over 30%. We went through the roof and we were so worried about, the, you know, having an audience that would pro predominantly probably be older and likely cocooners, but actually went through the roof. And, uh, you know, we'd always done home baking and things yes. that people were turning to. So in a way, there was like this, oh, the whole world is now our readers, not just one section. Of and you've society, got a captive so. audience as well now because people are, are uh, in lockdown. Yeah. So exactly. They're yeah, reading yeah, yeah. more than they probably would be when they when when they were out. But yeah. uh, tell me a little bit before we finish about um, giving one night to change a lifetime. That's with Focus Ireland. I've been doing that for a long time with Sister Stan. Big fan of hers. I it's went amazing. to school. Amazing. I went to school in Stan Hope Street, and of course she's at the back of that. Um, I think myself, um, as a business person, I felt, you know, the business community could do so much more. And it started off, um, in fact, you have a photo behind you with uh, Anne O'Leary and Louise Phelan um, from uh, Anne, of course, is Vodafone and Louise has now, has now left. But she, that was the first night in Christchurch, I think, that I did. It was freezing cold, lashing rain, but it was a you way the business... In it. Yeah, it was the way the business community kind of, uh, and then we've moved, moved now to down to in to uh, much more palatial, but still outdoors and everything else. But it's less. Uh, Christchurch is very loud, and you can, you know, if it isn't the bins or the guard sirens, it's the homelessness themselves coming to heckle us for daring to try and pretend we were going to be homeless for a night. Um, but it's. It's just one thing that doesn't let you understand what homelessness is about. But, you know, when you face your bed the next day after a night sleeping rough, you do get a sense of, oh, my goodness, if you were doing this night in, night out, you'd really understand it. Increasingly, our, my focus and their focus, too, is on um, 
homeless families and children, um, not traditional rough sleepers, as it were. That's that's always an issue um, in terms of emergency accommodation. But people who fall into homelessness through rent and through difficulty, adversity, a lot of women in domestic violence in that situation as well. Uh, so I, I don't just do that like on Women's Day, on International Women's Day last year, I did. I said you know, the business community can all talk to each other because you do that all day, every day, 365 days of the year. But on International Women's Day, we should be reaching out to women who are in homelessness. Yes. And I do yeah. a lot with um, I try and do a lot with DOCUS, the women's prison. So they yeah. all came to that event. The Lord Mary. Well, that must be fascinating. Mm. Yeah, that must be fascinating. So, but Nora, um, I suppose. Oh, you've been absolutely amazing today. I mean, you've been so giving of your time. But I suppose the one question, I know you've been asked it before and you've hedged it many times, I think. Um, have you ever thought uh, of of uh, putting yourself forward for the Auras itself? I know you know, you, I know, I know you have said that your own house is the greatest house there, there is, but... Um, you know, would I you think, consider yeah, going for the presidency of the of Ireland? The, so the honest truth about politics, let's say generally, is I'm not really, I'm a very political person, but I've never joined a political party. Yes. I was very political in London. I was a member of all sorts of different committees in the House of Commons. It was like my second home. I'm very political here, as in, you know, I understand and want to work and engage within politics. But yeah. the idea of being a politician, oh my goodness. Would kill you. <laughs> oh, listen, look, in my small way, as a private individual, I can independently do far more. Yeah, if I, if I find If I find an area I want to focus on, oh boy, will it get my focus and attention. I can actually do far more with me, myself and I, without anyone telling me what my opinions and views are, or I would really, be suspicious of myself as a politician as to why I had taken various decisions. At least I know that I'm true to my heart now and yeah. I make decisions and that my opinions are heartfelt. They're not ones that I've manufactured because somebody needs to vote for me. Um, and I, I also think that um, my life has been pretty turbulent up until now. And it's, you know, I like the fact that I'm here with Dara and, you know, we're very contented. I'm very contented in my life. I don't like making big decisions about my future because I've just learned Your future happens from life. Happens. <laughs> I've learned that life has curveballs for me and there's no point in me planning or making decisions at this very moment in time. You go with the flow. I have not enough hours in the day to do all the fabulous things I want to do. Not I don't even see it as to do. Think of how gloriously you could be decorating the auras. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> one room at a time. And they'd never oh, see no. me. <laughs> <laughs> Dara would never see you. No one would. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, no Mary. Nora, you've been a, a joy, honestly, an absolute joy. What started off, I, I was never been so nervous. I said doing my Viva for my PhD wasn't half as nervous Don't as, I, and then, you know, we had a few technical glitches at the start with my microphone, but all went well and it, and it was an absolute joy to have you on. And I wish you um, huge success in everything you do because you, you certainly deserve it. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Mary. Best of luck. You too. God bless you. Bye-bye.